The last 100 years have seen a monumental battle. The race to become the fastest man on Earth. This is the story of the land speed record, of those who have paid its ultimate price, and of those who have lived to tell the tale. The current land speed record is held by Britain Andy Green. It stands at 763 miles per hour, faster than the speed of sound. It takes great courage and skill to take the controls of a land speed car. Few experiences on Earth can beat this. Horsepower. <laughs> the feeling of power and the whole thing is trembling when his power is coming up. It's something to do. I was in serious trouble. 569 miles an hour, and I had literally no way to stop the car. I was traveling this fast, over 400 miles an hour, and wasn't slowing down. The thing came through, and they said, you know, you've done it. That's a new world record. Congratulations. Fantastic moment. This is a lifetime dream for me. This is something I was put on Earth to do. That's my ambition, to be the fastest man, the fastest man on Earth. The land speed record was first set in 1898 on a country lane in France in an electric car. The speed was 39 miles per hour. Four years later, another French driver tried to convince the world that steam power was best. He achieved 75 miles per hour. But eventually, the far more powerful internal combustion engine came of age. The first American to challenge the record was Henry Ford, keen to publicize his fledgling automobile company. Ford was the first man to top 90 miles per hour. In 1911, the International Automobile Federation, the FIA, was founded to certify all land speed attempts. To ensure that no one could benefit unfairly from sloping ground or wind, a set of simple rules was drawn up. Each attempt had to be timed over a course of exactly one mile. The car had to refuel and make a return run through the same mile within one hour. Its speed was the average of the two runs. By the 1920s, the focus had moved to Great Britain, and drivers were pushing towards 150 miles per hour. The contenders took their machines to the 10-mile-long Pendine Sands in Wales. Malcolm Campbell was the first to break the 150-mile-per-hour barrier. Scientists of the time were sure that no car would ever go faster. Perry Thomas proved them wrong. In 1926, he topped 171 miles per hour. But soon after, he became the first man to be killed attempting the land speed record. In 1927, British officer Henry Seagrave headed for the 20-mile-long Daytona Beach in Florida. 120,000 people crowded the sands to watch the Mad Major. Seagrave did not disappoint. His audience saw him become the first man on land or sea or air to break the 200 mile per hour barrier. Not satisfied with the land speed record, Seagrave took delivery of a powerboat called Miss England, but it was a tragic mistake. He died attempting to become the fastest man on water. Seagrave's success on American soil sparked a rivalry between British and American drivers that exists to this day. American Frank Lockhart was the next to make an attempt, but at 220 miles per hour, a rear tire burst, throwing his car out of control and flinging him to his death.
Ray Keach was the next American to take up the challenge. In a powerful three-engine car, he set a new record speed of 207 miles per hour. His success was short-lived. He was killed in a race only six months later. American Lee Bible also tried to get into the record books, but he too failed. At over 200 miles per hour, his car swerved off the track, killing Bible and a news cameraman in his path. To achieve the coveted land speed record, you had to put your life on the line. With all his principal rivals dead, in 1931, Malcolm Campbell took his Bluebird car across the Atlantic to regain the record. Campbell quickly raised the record to 246 miles per hour, but he wanted to go even faster. If anybody would like a real thrill, I suggest that they drive this old car at a speed of anything between 270 and 280 miles an hour, and they'll get a real kick, I can assure them of that. As Campbell pushed towards 300 miles per hour, Bluebird's power was wasted as its wheels slipped on the sand. He needed a harder surface on which to run. As soon as Campbell saw the perfectly level 50 miles of Bonneville salt flats, he knew it was the ideal place. The hard salt would provide good traction for his tires. A 12-mile stretch of salt was scraped smooth and an oil guideline laid down the center. In the early morning of September 3, 1935, Campbell took his chance and drove as fast as he dared. After his first run, he was on target to take the record, but there was a problem. His tires had almost melted through. On his return run, he was dicing with death. Campbell made it through. His ninth and final record was 301 miles per hour. The Berengaria brings home the king of racing drivers, Sir Malcolm Campbell, returning after his adventures in raising the world's land speed record. Malcolm Campbell's exploits had made him a household name. In this newsreel, he introduced his son Donald to the world. I've made mechanics a great hobby all my life, and I think that they make a boy persevering, and uh, any failure is an incentive to just still further effort. This is all very well, Dad, but when are you going to teach me to drive a car? <laughs> when you get old enough, old boy. British Army Captain George Easton was inspired by Campbell. He wanted to keep the record with Britain. His seven-ton twin-engine Thunderbolt amazed the crowds. It was an aluminum monster, and by 1938 had clocked up a record of 345 miles per hour. In 1939, another Englishman, John Cobb, brought his beautifully streamlined Railton Special to Bonneville. Its massive aircraft engines cooled with tanks of ice powered Cobb through the next milestone, 350 miles per hour. All record attempts were suspended during World War II. Then in 1947, a huge crowd watched Cobb try to exceed 400 miles per hour. He nearly made it. 394 and 196,000 miles per hour over the measured mile. John Cobb has taken a terrific beating, but he's happy. He's driven the fastest mile in the fastest car in the world. After his triumphant return to Britain, Cobb went to Loch Ness in Scotland to attempt the water speed record. Cobb raced through the measured mile at over 200, and then there's a horrified crowd, his wife among them looked on. Disaster! But Cobb's land speed record of 394 miles per hour was to stand for 16 years. During World War II, the revolutionary jet engine had been developed to power the fastest fighter planes. Hot rodders at Bonneville 
were quick to realize the jet engine's potential. One of the first jet car pioneers was 26-year-old Glenn Leisher in his car, Infinity. On test runs, he achieved a peak speed of 330 miles per hour. But when he entered the measured mile, his car exploded. Leisher was killed instantly. Dr. Nathan Ostich was not deterred. Ray Brock was enlisted as his engineer. We just knew we wanted to go fast. Doc wanted to go fast. And we were all his crew. It was all volunteer labor. I worked on his car for nothing. He delivered my kids for nothing. Didn't know anything about jet engines. And as we stripped them further and further down, we found out the size of the engines. And that's what determined the size of the car. First time we really got the car cooking pretty good was in 1962. We had no idea what it was going to do. We, we were hoping it'd go 400 miles an hour. As it turned out, it didn't quite go that fast. Uh, we got up to 360 miles an hour three times in a row. And that's when we decided to hang it up. The flying Caduceus car had four exposed tires and wheels, so uh, we knew that it, it, it would not break the record. It had uh, too much aerodynamic drag. Since the age of 10, Craig Breedlove had been building his own cars, and at 14 was competing at Bonneville. He soon had his eye on the ultimate prize. The land speed record was pretty much out of reach. I mean, the cost of it and sophistication of it was quite beyond our capability, and it wasn't until Mickey Thompson built that four-engine Challenger that I saw that an average guy could put a car together and actually go challenge for the unlimited record. It's a car, believe it or not. In Los Angeles, Craig Breedlove unveils the spirit of America, his jet-powered three-wheel streamliner designed to go 500 miles an hour or more. But Breedlove had a problem. The rules stated that at least 60% of the engine's power must turn the wheels. A jet car is held on the ground with aerodynamic downforce. None of the wheels actually propels the car. The main design criteria was to build a three-wheeler, and that came about as a result of contacting the FIA to see if they would sanction a pure jet thrust car, and, and of course they declined to do that. Breedlove was confident that the FIA would eventually recognize jet cars. In the meantime, he had to classify his Spirit of America as a jet motorcycle. By August 1963, Craig Breedlove's jet car had exceeded 400 miles per hour. The following year, the FIA relented. Since 1964, there have been two categories of the land speed record. Wheel driven and jet unlimited. Donald Campbell, son of land speed legend Sir Malcolm Campbell, was determined to break Cobb's record while abiding by the original rules. The gas turbine engine in his Proteus Bluebird used jet thrust to turn a turbine and power the wheels through a conventional gearbox. At Bonneville in 1960, he made his first attempt. Campbell told the world's press what happened next. It took off, it was airborne for a thousand feet. And during that time, it rolled over three times before finally coming down sideways on, showing off two wheels and sliding a, a, another hundred yards. Campbell was not about to quit. He needed an even bigger area, so he shipped his entire team to one of the largest salt lakes in the world, Lake Eyre in the Australian outback. His daughter, Gina, was a member of the team. Although it was a salt-crusted lake, it had 
hundreds and hundreds of what they called little salt islands, and they all had to be graded and knocked off, and that was a very timely and costly exercise. Despite the setbacks, in September 1964, Donald Campbell finally achieved 403 miles per hour, breaking John Cobb's 16-year-old record of 394 miles per hour. It was just exciting for me, what was I, 14 years old, you know, to be on the other side of the world and to be there with my father on, on such a monumental occasion. After his return to England, Campbell was determined to set a new water speed record. Like Seagrave and Cobb before him, Campbell died on the water. Campbell's boat literally takes off, flips into the air, then crashes and explodes. I never, ever dreamt that anything would happen to my father on water. My grandfather was one of the only record breakers that died in his bed. You know, he died of a stroke, and I suppose given the choice, I know which way my dad would have preferred to go. Short, sharp, and quick. The first to challenge Donald Campbell's wheel-driven record were Bob and Bill Summers with Goldenrod. Well, it was a big chore. It took us a year to build a car. It took us a year to get the sponsorship before that. The Goldenrod was our ninth car. We knew how much horsepower we needed. We knew what the car shape basically was going to be like. The car had four Chrysler uh, 426 Hemis, the NASCAR motors they ran in Daytona Beach in those days. With four engines, two gearboxes, and a custom drivetrain, it was a complex machine. In August 1965, Bill Summers drove the Goldenrod at Bonneville to a new wheel-driven record of 409 miles per hour. Don Vesco's car, the Turbinator, Powered by a gas turbine engine from a helicopter is the latest challenger for the wheel-driven record. I followed Campbell and Cobb and, you know, the Bluebird and always wanted to do it. It just uh, took till now to, to get there. I've always been competitive. If you and your friend are going to the grocery store to get some bubble gum, it was, uh, it was a race to see who got to the store first. And you didn't have to say, let's race. It was just, that's what you did. I, I, don't know, I don't know if everybody's that way, but that's the way I am. I started with model airplane engines and uh, then lawnmower motors. And you had to be careful around our house. You didn't leave something lay around too long because it would end up you know, bolted on the back of some little cart or something going around the block. This car is a direct drive, there's no clutch. It's got a reduction box in the front of the engine because the engine turns 16,000 RPM when it's at maximum. The exhaust air actually drives over these, these blades that turn the output shaft. So it works basically like a torque converter on a car or on a snowmobile. And so it's, it's pretty slow in the beginning about, I, I compare it to riding on a city bus. About the time you get a mile into the run, it takes off about like a jet airplane does. All the pressure goes through the engine into the combustion chamber. All of a sudden it hits and, and you're going. On a practice run on El Mirage Dry Lake in California, Don Vesco challenged one of the fastest production cars, the Dodge Viper. Well, the comparison to Viper is if we both left the line at the same time it's still on the throttle, He'd probably be a mile and a half down the road before I got up to 60 miles an hour. I wouldn't want to race a Volkswagen for the first mile.
Don Vesco plans to go for the wheel-driven record. Our goal is to go 500 miles an hour, and then uh, maybe if we got good enough ground to run on, it's possible the car will go 600. By 1963, Craig Breedlove had driven 407 miles per hour and forced the ruling body to accept the Jet Unlimited category. Breedlove had used a J-47 jet engine. In Akron, Ohio, one man had managed to get a hold of a powerful J-79 fighter engine. It was a military machine and was not supposed to be in the hands of Art Arfons. I uh, called GE and told them I had a J-79 and needed a manual, and they said, no, you don't have one. And the uh, next day, there was a man from Washington there who wanted to see if I had a classified engine. He said, you can't have this engine. And I said, I bought it off this man. It was junk. It's my engine. And I never heard no more about it, so I guess I got by with it. Arfon's engine had been scrapped by the Air Force after a loose bolt had damaged the turbine blades. Well, it's they're sort of simple. There are about a, oh, a thousand blades in there. And if one was torn up on one side, you flip it over and count the blades and you either take the opposite one or 120 degrees and take two out. And I did that and I had about 60 some blades out of the engine when I ran it. And it was balanced good and ran good. First time I fired it, I chained it between two trees and uh, went into power and it just blew everything out of the way, killed the trees. <laughs> it was quite an exciting thing to fire that big engine up. A third challenger, Tom Green, wanted to take on Breedlove and Arfons. He was a trained engineer and had a deep understanding of aerodynamics. I would say predominantly I learned what engineering I knew and what aerodynamics I knew in the service, uh, having been educated at White Sands Proving Grounds, where we fired the last of the captured B-2 rockets. The aerodynamic thing was just a super personal interest to me. And you know, anybody that keeps looking at the same problem from all the different angles is bound to come up with a logical answer. I had a standard two and a half car home garage in Wheaton, Illinois. The idea, therefore, was to design the car so it would fit in my garage from corner to corner. My contribution was physical body and fender work, along with the fact that I was going to engineer the basic aerodynamics. I felt really part of the team. I didn't uh, contract to be the driver uh, because there were three drivers before me anyhow. Number one, there was Walt Arpons, and he had too many heart attacks. Number two, there was another guy whose name I, I will not mention, but he was a lead foot. They didn't want to trust him with it. And the third guy, I made the cockpit too small for him so he couldn't fit into it. There was no choice. Green had to drive his own car. I was sitting there the last day that we were allowed to try for the record. And I thought to myself, am I going to have to come back here next year and go through all this again? Heck no, I'm going for it. I can tell you and I'll remember the rest of my life. I knew I had to apply more power, so I left the afterburner on longer. The airspeed of the indicator was traveling this fast, over 400 miles an hour, and wasn't slowing down. I had the most tremendous feeling of power that I've ever had, or that I'll ever have. Tom Green was the first man to set the new Jet Unlimited record of 413 miles per hour. After I beat the record, all the other fellows who had had so much of an experience with speed thought, well, if this guy can go out and break it, certainly I can, and they all did. <laughs> Less than 24 hours after Green broke the record, Art Arfons was back on the salt with his car, the Green Monster. I didn't think I was really taking a risk. The car was built solid and it handled good. It was no problem. I really wasn't scared of it.
first pass, I think, uh, was over 300. And the car vibrated a lot, and you know, it sort of shook so bad it was hard seeing out of the windshield. The next day, I went over 400, and uh, it smoothed out. It seemed like vibration went away, and it was really good. After, uh, after 400, the faster I went, the better it drove. Every car had to be timed through a measured mile in opposite directions within one hour. We took about four miles to stop and only took two miles to get going. And we were actually two miles past where we wanted to start to return run. And they said, we're going to run out of time. And I said, well, I'll just drive it from here back. And when I get to the two mile mark, I'll go ahead and get on it. And uh, that's, that was the run I made then. Well, you didn't know until the timers got word to you. I went real fast, <laughs> and I got a, uh, got a pretty good record then. Oh, the crew went mad, you know, they really did something. But uh, it wasn't, wasn't nothing. <laughs> he went 434 miles per hour. Eight days later, it was Breedlove's turn. He broke Arfon's record with a 468 mile per hour run. The battle for the Jet Unlimited record had caught the public imagination. Sponsors got behind the two main contenders. It was a race between Craig and I or Goodyear and Firestone. Well, it was a combination of both. We both wanted to go fast, but they wanted us to push a little harder. The pressure was on Breedlove to put the record beyond reach and become the first man to break 500 miles per hour. We ran 513 on the run down in the morning. I took pretty good pounding in the car. We made the turnaround at the far end of the course and we still hadn't used 100% power, so I had not ever operated the parachutes at that speed. The first thing that happened on the return run was that I sheared a suspension bolt and I was prepared to abort the run, but I found that I could kind of steer into this broken suspension and I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll just hang in there and see if I can make it through the lights. Breedlove was traveling at 569 miles per hour. So I pushed the button for the parachutes and I didn't get any parachute response. He's out of the mile. I see a smoke trail. Something came off of the car. So then I pushed the button for the emergency, and the gun went off, but I still didn't get a parachute. He lost his chute. He lost his chute. I checked the switches, and then I thought, well, you know, you've already heard the powder charge, so there's no, it's not an electrical problem. You just don't have any parachutes. He's in the three, and he's not slowing down. At that point in time, obviously, I was, I was in serious trouble. Man, he's really moving. Very high speed and literally no way to stop the car. The brakes were useless at that velocity. As I got closer and closer to the phone poles, it was pretty apparent that I was going to impact them. And then I hit that salt embankment and that put the car airborne. It skipped once and then the water grabbed it and, and uh, it's, it sunk. Miraculously, Breedlove managed to escape from his sinking car. <laughs> what a ride! <laughs> For my next trick! <laughs> you didn't make it up. I'll set myself on fire. <laughs> we did have the 500 record, but that sort of uh, put me out of business. Hey, buddy, how you doing? <laughs> By the end of 1964, Art Arfon still had enough power left in his car to raise the record to 544 miles per hour. There really wasn't much of an alternative, except to, in, in order to get the record back, we had to build a new car. By the autumn of 1965, Craig Breedlove was ready with Sonic One. His new car was built in only six months, and some hasty modifications were needed before Breedlove could push for a new record. On 
On his first run, Breedlove was out of control, heading for the same telegraph poles he had crashed into the year before. This time, he managed to stop before he ran out of salt. His perseverance paid off. Only days later, Breedlove took the record back from Arfons at 555 miles per hour. But Arfons was not a man to give up. He replied with 576 miles per hour. Breedlove had been the first person to break 400 and then 500 miles per hour. He was determined to retake the record from Arfons. He was the first through 600 miles per hour. Obviously a period of elation to accomplish the record, followed immediately after by somewhat of an anticlimactic letdown. <laughs> like, well, now what do we do? Arfons needed more speed, but he knew he was taking a big risk pushing the green monster any faster. Well, apprehensive is, is a good word, you know. When you sit down and you get ready to go, you, your mind's running through what, what I've done, what I've checked, and what can happen. But once I start the engine, then nothing bothered me. As soon as I got that engine running, I was set. But 600 miles per hour was too fast for the green monster. I lost the front wheel from lack of lubrication. I hadn't been keeping an eye on it. The wheel came off and that was, uh, it dug in about, oh, I seen the marks about a foot deep in the salt and then it flipped in for end and went right over. It happened so quick. I had no inkling I was in trouble until I seen the uh, horizon was on the wrong side of the windshield and I knew it was upside down. <laughs> It went uh, 527 feet before it hit, but when it hit, I was out. I didn't remember nothing else until it was getting me out. Oh my god! You might as well get out. Let's go, let's go. Come on, Ed. Come on. There's no sense of holding up any longer. I knew you should have done it. Look at a hole there. I was beat up real bad, like a uh, price fighter got a hold of me. My head was all swelled up. And, it knocked my helmet off. My wife, every time I come home and say I'm going to build another car, it was a, a fight, and she didn't want it. <laughs> she said she's put up with it long enough. It's about time I quit. From August 1964 to November 1965, the unlimited land speed record had increased from 413 to 601 miles per hour. Craig Breedlove had come out on top, but it would be many years before he would attempt to break the land speed record again. In 1970, an innovative new challenger appeared at Bonneville. The Blue Flame, powered by a liquid natural gas rocket, had more power than even a jet engine. Hot rodder Gary Gabalich was chosen to ride the Blue Flame. There were many setbacks before the unique gas-powered rocket showed its true potential. Shortly after dawn on September 8th, Gary Gabalich blasted into the record books. The Blue Flame speed was 622 miles per hour. Nineteen eighty two. Twenty years had passed since a British driver had held the land speed record. Richard Noble's first car seemed little more than a jet powered go kart. Well, the whole project from the start of Thrust One took nine years. All the time you're up against um, up the knockers who say, Oh, you never pull that off. But the extraordinary thing is that the toughness of it, um, that is terribly important because basically it breeds an organization that just will not be upset by anything, will take on anything and anybody in order to get there. Noble's team was tested to the limit. 
He crashed thrust two on a test run in England. He's crashed. Unseasonal rain washed their hopes away at Bonneville. They knew there had to be somewhere else to run. There was the Black Rock Desert in Nevada. As soon as I saw it, I said, this is it. I mean, you know, this is, this is far better than Bonneville ever could be. Here you've got 140 square miles of brown billiard table. And the other thing too is that you've got a surface which was ever so slightly soft. And so instead of the wheel hammering, the, wheel, the, the wheels uh, tracked very truly and very nicely. So the whole car suddenly became stable. It suddenly appeared to be in its element. And suddenly I felt very confident. I thought, well, hell, we can do it now. Despite the improved surface, during 1982, they were unable to beat Gavilich's record. Noble persuaded the sponsors to stick with the project for one more year. 12 months later, he was back at Black Rock Desert. He knew this was his last chance. The only thing about a record attempt is that everybody knows it's the day, except me. They were convinced this is the day, this is when it was going to happen. Sitting in that damn car, you can't get out, you know, it's a waste of time getting out. Terrified that somebody's going to say, I'm sorry we can't run, you know, something's gone wrong. The last run of all was absolutely cracking run and we got up to 650.88 miles an hour. So we'd actually gone a little bit faster than the design speed, which is an enormous tribute to the team. came through and they said, you know, you've done it. That's a new world record, congratulations. Fantastic moment. Nine years sweat. On the other side of the world, an Australian was determined to end the British and American dominance of the land speed record. I got very inspired when Richard Noble went out on a shoestring budget and set a world record. This is a lifetime dream for me. This is something I was put on earth to do. I've got the perfect body for the job. Um, it's it's my, uh, my ambition to be the fastest man, the fastest man on earth. Roscoe McLashen had cut his teeth in the exciting world of speedway and hot rods. He raises money for his land speed attempts by displaying his jet dragster, Aussie Invader One. Please welcome to Jelton City Speedway, Roscoe McGlashan and the fabulous Aussie Invader, the Jet Car. In 1995, McGlashan brought his Aussie Invader 2 car to Lake Gairdner in South Australia to try to beat Richard Noble's record. Just about everything that could have gone wrong did. Yeah, on our last excursion here back in 95, we had a series of different problems. A fire started in the auxiliary bay on the left-hand side of the car. There you go, guys, we've got trouble. The air I was breathing started to taste very sour. I was doing something like 900 kilometres an hour, so I had to rip the mask off because my breathing air was contaminated. And um, off with the throttle, put the parachutes out, but it still took me nearly nine kilometres to stop the car. I couldn't hold the breath for that long. When I got down to 300 mile an hour, I actually had to punch the canopy up and lift the canopy up to try and get some air in there. It was very hard trying to hold the canopy up at high speed with the wind pressure pushing it down and trying to steer the car and see where you're going. But I had to make a decision which was more important, to keep breathing, to keep seeing, or keep steering. And um, yeah, but we, we lived through it. McLashen reached 655 miles per hour but the soft salt sent him off course on the return run. We were out there running fast when we shouldn't have been. The salt wasn't in good enough, Nick. We broke through the salt and the car just tramlined straight into the timing gear. The moment of impact, I knew it was all over. Aussie Invader 2 was damaged beyond repair. McLashen vowed to build another car and challenge again. Back in England, Richard Noble had decided to go for the sound barrier. The first prototype was a small British Mini. 
Craig and I met on the Bonneville Salt Flats in 1990, and uh, we were there with Art Arfons, and Craig took me on one side and he said, I bought two engines. And I knew then that he wasn't going to say any more, but that meant that he was going back, and since he was the first ever 400, 500, 600, it had got to be 700, and of course the speed of sound is only 50 miles an hour away, so, you know, it made very good sense. So that's obviously what he was going to do. And we were two years behind. We got to catch up with a car which has got two engines, which is bigger and heavier, it's a far, far bigger project. So I really was faced with a decision, either to drive the car or to run the project. So I thought, well, I've driven the car, I held the record, so perhaps we'll run the project this time. The man selected to drive the car, British Royal Air Force pilot Andy Green, was no stranger to supersonic speeds. Thrust SSC's design philosophy was to use aerodynamic downforce to keep the car on the ground and provide massive power to overcome the drag. They took a lot of risk in doing very new things on the car. One was a rear wheel steering and then of course the twin engine configuration because there's a certain risk of asymmetric thrust. But um, I believe that it's ultimately a a, a battle of minimizing the drag as opposed to maximizing the power. Essentially to have the car just skim across the top of the ground. So the approach with Spirit of America was, was one to minimize drag and, and, uh, and just we didn't worry too much about the power. <laughs> Craig Breedlove is probably one of the greatest record breakers of the lot. He's been very smart in the way that he's minimized the cross-sectional area. That he's ended up with a long, thin car. But his driving position is right out the front. And that's not so much fun because basically you're, you're way ahead of the central gravity, you're ahead of the front wheels. And um, these cars, certainly if the thrust two is anything to go by, basically they slide all over the place. 1996 was a frustrating year for Breedlove. Stability did prove to be a problem for his car. During a test run, it flipped onto its side, causing half a million dollars worth of damage. Breedlove had to spend the rest of the year rebuilding his car. Richard Noble had chosen the Al Jaffa Desert in Jordan for Thrust SSC's first runs. It was a difficult time. When freak storms forced them to return home, they had not even matched Noble's old record. In September 97, Noble returned to Black Rock Desert for the first time in 14 years. 30 separate 10 mile long tracks had to be prepared for the enormous Thrust SSC. Each track was painstakingly scoured for any small stones or debris that could be sucked into the engines. On September 14th, Andy Green achieved an average speed of 714 miles per hour, a new record. Breaking Noble's existing record wasn't enough. The real prize was the sound barrier itself. As Andy Green pushed Thrust SSC ever faster, things started to go wrong. Look at shoot one. Nothing on shoot one, look at shoot two. Two miles to go, 400 miles an hour. Recovery, be advised, SSC, double shoot failure, 350, 1.5 to go, will be a long one. So the, uh, the heat from the engines had burned the parachutes. He was now a mile and a half further down the course, and 15 minutes were wasted towing the car back to the start. On the return run, thrust SSC topped 761 miles per hour. It had gone supersonic in both directions. Um, unfortunately, you missed it by about a minute. Oh, no. They would have to try again. Yeah, it's a shame. Good effort, the thrust team was determined to set the first official supersonic land speed record. On September 15, 1997, in front of the world's cameras, they tried again. Mac number is, say, 1.015.
It's a supersonic run there. The clock is going now. We've been five minutes, 26 seconds since the car entered the measured mile. We've got to be back within the hour. This is where the tension really builds. On the return run, everything went right. Number on the return run 1.020. Yeah. Yeah. We've just achieved what we set out to achieve all those years ago. Eh? That's, um, <laughs> it's really something. Thrust SSE did surprise me in its performance. I frankly didn't think it would be as fast as it was. I, I felt that the, the drag uh, would be a lot higher and that they would actually experience um, some difficulty in, and perhaps uh, have, have a difficult time breaking Richard's existing record at 633. And uh, you know, I, I was off by 100 miles an hour. If you've got enough power, and strong enough undercarriage and push it into the ground hard enough and have a big enough tail on it, it doesn't have to be beautiful. Well, when I first seen it, you know, it looked like a real heavy tank, but that's why I kept it on the ground. I, it, it was prettier every time it ran. <laughs> now it's beautiful. <laughs> Thrust SSC was covering a mile of the Black Rock Desert every five seconds. But soon, this vast expanse will be too small for even faster land speed attempts. Roscoe McLashen is determined to bring the land speed record to Australia. You look around here and you think, oh, well, it looks pretty vast, but um, it's very hard to appreciate. You know, we run a uh, 22 to 24 kilometer course, depending just on how good the, the salt is, but um, that's only a very, very small portion of the lake. The lake's 150 kilometers long, or nearly 100 mile. There's something about this place, a ghostly type feeling that someone's watching you all the time, and every time you bring the race car, every time we bring the race car near this place, it rains. I will admit I'm an extremely uh, superstitious person, very superstitious, and uh, a couple of people have said to us, well, really what we should do is get the local elders of the Aboriginal tribes out here to bless our record, and uh, to me it sounds a bit bizarre, but um, I think we're really going to be trying something next time we come out here. After destroying his car in 1995, McGlashan and his team have built a totally new machine, Aussie Invader 3. We should be able to set a world record for a uh, single engine car. Uh, once the car's run 710 mile an hour, we're going to repair it. We're looking at a uh, F14 engine. Uh, quite a few of those are becoming obsolete in America very soon and go from 18,500 pound of thrust up to 38,000. The first land speed record that was set by a Frenchman, they said he wouldn't be able to breathe at 39 mile an hour. So um, it's, I've always believed the sound barrier has just been a, been a number, but I don't even need to guess anymore. Uh, Richard Noble, Andy Green have proved that it's a, a, it's a possibility, it's happened, it's history. So what we've got to look at now is just making a car with half the power go faster. And I believe on a very hard surface like at Lake Gairdner, with a car that's uh, a, a lot slicker, we can do it. Craig Breedlove took his first land speed record 35 years ago. He's also determined to go supersonic and bring the record back to America. The 633 record, you know, seemed very doable. The fact that it's at 763 now certainly raises the bar a lot, but uh, fortunately the car, I believe, has the potential to do that. So. Uh, our goal is uh, still to get the record back, it's just that we have a lot higher bar to uh, climb to. McGresham and Breedlove and the boys with the 104, they're, they're all kidding themselves. They, they don't have the power. If Andy ran out of power with, with 110,000 horse, I don't know what they're going to do with just half that. I, I don't think they're going to do it. They're fighting a losing battle. <laughs> thousand miles an hour is somewhere on the horizon. It'll take another 
another generation of vehicle to to uh, to do it, and it, it'll be hard hard and coming because the uh, increments now are are getting more and more difficult. The the uh, mountain is getting steeper and steeper to climb.